<laughs> oh, so what? Okay. Uh, so, so, so f f first of all, um, I, I, I just got a, a message that, that this meeting is recorded. Was it not recorded before? Uh, unfortunately, it was not. Ah, okay. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay, I, I was just, I was just checking because it was uh, all right. Okay, so another point is that if a moment is uh, semi-positive, then essentially uh, similar things should apply, and this is uh, this is uh, work in progress. Somehow the, the technical details are slightly more involved. <clears throat> and uh, another remark is that uh, in this case. If the characteristic of the field is zero, so think just k equal to q, then for all sufficiently large primes, we have a, a simple uh, periodic orbit, uh, periodic point. Okay, so it's not just infinitely many, but uh, they somehow grow like the primes. All right, and uh, so the proof has uh, uh, two ingredients. One is barcodes of uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, which was uh, introduced as, as such in symplectic topology in, um, in, in work of uh, Pultorovich uh, and me, and also, and also in, in paper of Asher and Zhang, but it has uh, uh, previous uh, incarnations, if you wish, in, in work of Fukaya, o, Ota, and Ono, and also in, in, in work of Asher on concept of boundary depth. <laughs> and also, uh, the, the second uh, part is the Smith theory. Smith, Smith theory in uh, filtered Fleur homology. So, um, about Smith theory, I must say that there are many uh, mathematicians whose last name is Smith that are involved in these two ingredients. So, for example, this Smith is, 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 is this Smith. And this Smith is this Smith. And actually, <clears throat> there's also Henry Smith, who is responsible for Smith normal form. And this is related to, uh, to the approach of Fukaya or Ota and Ono. <clears throat> to, uh, what they call torsion exponents. In my language, it's called uh, um, Smith. All right. So, 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 so let me say something about, about barcodes. So just somehow in the test case of functions, let's, let's look at these two functions on S1, All right? So, so you choose a parameterization of S1, you parameterize these curves, and then you, you take the height function. So that, that's a function. Of course, it depends on parameterization. And if you want to compare these two functions, let's say in just the, the, the soup norm, C0, C0 norm. Then you don't really know which parameterization you chose, so it makes sense to somehow compare F and the orbit of G under action of the femorphism group. And I claim that this infimum in this case is, is, uh, is one. So the fact that, that uh, you can do better than one plus epsilon for each epsilon is not, is not hard, it's kind of pretty, something pretty elementary. You, you basically kind of just push this one up and push this one, this one down and you get to G. <clears throat> but uh, somehow the, the non-trivial part is that it's uh, always at least one. And there are some ways to do it, but uh, the cleanest way involves some technology, uh, namely a persistence module. So <clears throat> a persistence module is a system of vector spaces over a field K and linear maps, uh, uh, well, from VA to VB when A is less than B. And uh, it should satisfy certain uh, conditions. For example, going from A to B and then from B to C is the same as going from A to C. Um, also, okay, also it's nice to require that the dimensions of all these uh, vector spaces are finite. And okay, th there's a certain finiteness condition that I, uh, I mentioned, but I don't want to comment on. 
And but I, what I do want to say is that uh, let's say we have like a, a, a closed manifold, and let's say we have a Morse function on this closed manifold, uh, or a function with let's say isolated critical points. Then uh, you can choose a degree if you'd like and look at the homology of the sublevel set of this function in this degree with these coefficients. And so, so th this forms a persistence model and inclusion maps, uh, you know, of one sublevel into the other uh, in, in, in induce this, uh, this structure maps of the, of the persistence model. Okay. All right. So um, then persistence models are, are, are particularly nice because they admit a normal form. So every persistence model is isomorphic to a finite direct sum of interval persistence modules. And, and, and finite here, uh, well, it follows from some technical, technical conditions that, uh, that I somehow skipped. Um, but in any case, there is more to, to, to a direct sum in general. Okay, and um, and what are these interval persistence models? Well, they are uh, well, uh, taking an interval, either finite one or infinite one, exactly like, like so. So either finite, AB, or infinite, A infinity. Right? We can put a, a vector space of, of, of dimension one on the interval. We, we can put zero everywhere of the interval. And we can require uh, all maps that can be identity to be identity and all the rest zero. They're, they're forced to be zero. Okay. And, and, and so uh, we get a multi set of intervals, which is you know, canonical up to isomorphisms of persistence models. And uh, so a multi set of intervals is called a barcode. I'm not sure I'm, <laughs> I'm very good in drawing barcodes. But in any case, uh, also now they're square. But, uh, okay. And so, so for, for a function, let's say uh, a Morse function, we have uh, a barcode associated to it via its uh, persistence model. And of course, if you wish to fix a degree, you can, you can, you can somehow fix a degree. And then a, a nice fact about uh, these barcodes is that if two functions are C0 close, then their barcodes are also close. And somehow the closeness is exactly measured by the, by, by, by the same, same, same number. And two, barcode, two barcodes are, are C close if one can get from one to the other by moving the endpoints of bars by less than C. In particular, if you have a, uh, an interval of length uh, less than twice C, you can erase it. Or you can create uh, also intervals of, of, of such a length. Right? Okay, and, and so here's a, here's a solution of, of, of this problem with the two functions. <clears throat> so let's assume that they're uh, one minus epsilon close. So by, by contradiction. Then we can uh, compute their barcodes. Actually, the barcodes that I'm, I'm computing here are, um, are in degree zero, are in degree zero. And actually, I'm, I'm doing that because somehow uh, barcode of degree one, we just have this one. So barcode of degree one for this, these two functions is, is, is not, not, so, not, not so interesting. And, and, and then you, you can see that there's no way you can move from one barcode to the other by, by moving endpoints by less than one. So that's the proof by contradiction. Okay. Um, but before I continue, I, I must uh, make a certain observation. So, 
You see, as a function g, it has six critical points, also f. So f, g, have six critical points. And now let's look, let's look at the barcode. So the barcode has, uh, well, b equal to two infinite bars. Right. Let's say this one and this one, and it has uh, k equal to two finite bars. And uh, and then so we can check the next. Th then n, which is two k plus b, uh, which is well six. So this is a uh, number of critical points. And, and some of the, this is not a not a coincidence. This is a this is a general fact, at least for Morse functions. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And um, and also this number b is actually the the total Betty number, right? It's kind of total Betty number of this one. So so let's let's reserve the notation b of k to be the total dimension of homology of M with coefficients in K. <clears throat> All right, so, so in this situation, wait, why am I? Okay. <clears throat> so in this situation for a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism in place of a Morse function, one can do exactly the same. So. Uh, one can associate, uh, uh, well, in the monotone case at least, a uh, finite barcode, um, which is uh, canonical up to shift. So, so it's kind of, it, 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 it depends on the Hamiltonian which you choose for a fee, but only up to shift. So, uh, for example, all, all the lengths of the bars are, are unaffected. And it has k finite bars and b of k infinite bars. And um, the number of contractible fixed points, well, this is a non-degenerate case, equal, uh, equals to k plus b. Okay, so, so, so we have a certain number, we have certain number of finite bars. Of course, some can come with multiplicity, which means just that they appear a few, uh, a few times, more than one time. So we have k finite bars and some number of infinite bars. All right, and th there are different ways of, of formulating this. Uh, one can, for example, ask for instead of a finite barcode and a locally finite barcode, which is kind of infinite but also periodic with respect to period group of the symplectic form. But um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, I, I prefer uh, to, to do a certain certain trick to f uh, pass to a finite barcode, exactly as before. All right. And then, uh, in the case of uh, isolated uh, fixed points, but possibly degenerate, uh, the same barcode exists, except that now the number of finite bars and, and the total Betty number, well, you, you still have a total Betty number of infinite bars, but the number of uh, finite bars and um, the number well, in the total Betty number, now, now satisfied to k plus b equal n, where n is, is this uh, homological count from before. Count. <clears throat> okay. And uh, I will review just a, just a tiny bit of uh, floor homology a bit later. But, but, but now, now I just like to say that, that the same works. And um, in particular, let's extract the lengths of all the finite bars in the barcode and organize them with respect to increasing length. Okay, so, so we have this uh, length spectrum, all these lengths of finite bars. <clears throat> and the, the maximal length of a bar uh, it was introduced by Usher and it's called boundary depth and it was introduced in, introduced in different terms uh, initially. 
And also, um, let's take the sum of all the bar lengths. So, so this is maybe, let's call it maybe like the total bar length. All right. <clears throat> and then uh, it's, uh, it's an easy observation that uh, the total bar length is len less than the maximal bar length times the number of bars. Okay. So it's, it's an easy observation, but it turns out to be useful, useful later. All right. Okay, uh, are, are there any questions? All right, so, so, all right. so if there are no, uh, uh, if there are no questions, let me, let me, let me continue. Uh, I'd like to make uh, two, somehow, if you wish, algebraic observations. So one is a universal coefficients formula. So uh, if you take the barcode of phi with q coefficients in the previous setting, and then you take it with fp coefficients, where fp is the prime field of characteristic p, <clears throat> then uh, for all p sufficiently large, you get the same thing. Right? So, so, it's, so, so it, is a, it, is a, it is a general, general kind of statement that uh, given enough finiteness, Whatever happens for Q happens for all sufficiently large primes, all right? So, so, so in particular, the, the number of bars is the same and the bar lengths are the same. And okay, we know that the total betting number is the same. So th this is kind of re really immediate from universal coefficients. All right, <clears throat> it is also true that semi-simplicity of the algebra is preserved. Maybe not the number of field sums, but semi-simplicity is preserved. <coughs> okay. And, um, and the next result is, is that, in fact, you can control, at least when uh, um, uh, simple, the symplectic manifold has semi-simple quantum homology, well, the, 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 even, the even part, then uh, the boundary depth, so the maximal length of a bar, is uniformly bounded, right, by 8n, but uh, you know, two, two of this eight was a kappa, which is the monotonicity uh, factor. Okay, and, uh, and, and we will use this with, with uh, FP coefficients, All right? Okay, so, 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 so the next part of the story is uh, the second ingredient, which is uh, Smith theory. <clears throat> All right, so, so, uh, so uh, classical, Inequality uh, due to Smith, Floyd, and others is the following. So uh, you take an action of uh, well ZP, or or in, in, in fact so the same works for 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 P groups. So for finite P groups, <coughs> and uh, let's see that acts on. Uh, 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 okay, let's say cl closed manifold. Works in, in large generality, but in any case. And then uh, we can consider it's a fixed point set. Also some, uh, also some, some space. And of course, uh, this is a subspace of, of, of our initial space. Okay. <clears throat> and, and then uh, uh, the, the inequality says that the total Betty number of the fixed point set is bounded above by the total Betty number of uh, the, uh, the manifold itself. And, and in fact, you, 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 you can take uh, invariant vectors here if you wish. It's, uh, yeah. So it's a stronger, stronger statement. At, uh, so uh, in, initially, this inequality was used by Smith to study uh, finite group actions. But it was also used by Tom in case uh, p equal to two uh, to study Betty bet numbers of real algebraic varieties. <clears throat> and you know, the, the idea here would be to apply this inequality to filtered Floer homology. And of course, it, this, is, this is not uh, quite so easy because in general, uh, it is unclear that uh, such x 
such x exists. <coughs> so one has to do something else. Um, and something else is, is, is basically to work with, uh, with Fleur homology and somehow define Fleur homological analogs of, of everything uh, in, 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 uh, in, in this uh, setup. <coughs> All right, so, 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 so uh, at least in the symplectically aspherical case, Fleur theory is a certain Morse theory for the uh, action functional on the space of contractible loops. I wrote it here. Uh, its critical points are contractible one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian flow. And then um, we can consider our Hamiltonian to be one periodic in time and go for time for time p. And, and, and here, here I wrote a, 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 a rescaling of this. Um, and then the action functional of this rescaled uh, Hamiltonian, which, by the way, gen generates uh, phi composed uh, p times, so the p iteration. So uh, this action functional is invariant under uh, zp action on the loop space, on the contractible loop space, that sends uh, loop z of t to the loop z of t plus 1 over t. Okay, and uh, in, in terms of fixed points, it, corris uh, it corresponds to fixed point x of phi to the p goes to phi of x, which is also fixed point of phi to the p. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, in, in another re remark is that if you take the, 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 the fixed points with respect to this action, you, you, you basically get uh, p iterated loops. <clears throat> okay, and, uh, and moreover, when you restrict the iterated Hamiltonian to these p iterated loops, you get the previous action functional, except that it's p times. So there is a scaling. There is, there is kind of a stretching. Stretching factor here. So, so then we expect Fleur homology of h to the p to act as as the um, as the x, and then uh, Fleur homology of x uh, of h to act as the as, as the fixed points, but uh, uh, to take care of the action functionals, we must stretch uh, all the actions. And so, in the symplectically spherical case, uh, one can prove the following statement: it's exactly the same um, Smith type inequality. And uh, so total uh, homology of, uh, oh, well, the Fleur homology of phi in action interval AB is less than uh, total dimension of homology of phi to the P in action PA, PB. All right. And okay, so uh, this is for, for all primes, but the case P equal two follows um, uh, follows rather uh, rather closely the, the, the work of Seidel from 2015. E even though, uh, so both work of Hendricks and Seidel were in a slightly different setting. They were uh, about symplectic mapping class groups. So they, they did not take actions into account. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, one can prove a stronger inequality. Um, so, uh, you know, there is a natural Z ZP action. One can take fixed points here, but in fact, one can do even better. One can uh, so can take even uh, so just somehow the, the number of of non-free uh, summons uh, non-free summons as uh, the P representation. So, you know, so one can also get rid of the, of the free piece here. Um, and uh, so similar, uh, the, the same thing applies to local Fleur homology. And in, in that case of local Fleur homology, there's a different proof of the same inequality by Ginsburg and Gurel 
uh, so, so, sorry, by, by my bad, by Chinelli and Ginsburg, uh, uh, that, that uses uh, generating functions. So in this case, there's actually a space X to which to apply uh, the Smith inequality. All right. Are there any questions? Yeah, Yegor, this is Nate. Um, yeah. Is the hypothesis of symplectically a spherical uh, um, just a technical one, or is it really important? Thank you very much for asking that. <laughs> so, um, so uh, in the monotone case, or you know, beyond the symplectically spherical case, uh, things become considerably more difficult. Because there you, you, you somehow start, start to have recappings. So if you take an interval, there will be somehow a whole bunch of recappings and it is not so easy to take that into account. However, you can still prove something which somehow in the, so, 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 so what you can prove is that the uh, total bar length grows linearly in the iteration or, or at least linearly in the iteration. So you can, prove that beta tot of phi to the p with fp coefficients is bigger than p times beta tot of uh, phi with fp coefficients, right? So, uh, and, and somehow in a spherical case, uh, you can get this by integrating uh, the Smith, Smith and equality. <clears throat> and so in the monotone case, one has to be uh, more careful and there is a certain algebraic way of getting it that uses a slightly different setup of lambda, of lambda zero coefficients. <clears throat> but uh, in, in fact, uh, one can also prove it somehow using uh, in integration and action windows, but, but, but uh, that's a different story. It's, Somehow, using uh, more fancy algebra turns out to be a more straightforward approach. Uh, curiously, ah, and uh, also I, I wanted to say that the symplectically spherical case gives uh, a new proof of Polterovich's no torsion theorem, uh, which says that in the symplectically spherical case, uh, finite order Hamiltonian diffeomorphism must be trivial, just identity. So there's no torsion. <laughs> and uh, so in, in the positively monotone case, uh, there is in general uh, no, uh, no torsion theorem. For example, you know, if you have a, a, a Hamiltonian S1 manifold, then you have plenty of uh, uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of finite order. Just take any rational kind of part of the. Uh. <laughs> okay, so, so just a little bit about, about the proof. I see that, that I'm getting kind of cl closer to time to stop. So uh, let me just very briefly give a very, very rough idea of, of the proof of the main theorem. So rough idea is that the, 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 the Hofer-Zender condition implies the existence of a finite bar of positive length. And, and then, uh, so, uh, uh, assuming that for a large prime you don't have um, any any new orbits, uh, the, the the counts will be the same. So in the non-degenerate case, it's kind of a uh, is it, just by, uh, by 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 condition. But um, in the degenerate case, one has to use a certain result of uh, of Ginsburg and Gure from two thousand and ten. <clears throat> And uh, so, 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 so this uh, for forces us to have exactly the same number of, of uh, finite bars for phi p with fp coefficients and for phi with fp coefficients. But earlier we saw by this universal coefficients theorem that uh, one can replace uh, fp by q here if p is large. Right? <clears throat> and uh, so uh, if um, p is sufficiently large, one can argue like so. So p times beta of p with, uh, with q coefficients is less than uh, so, so 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 this this is the this is the kind of uh, um, the, the analog 
of, of Smith, but, but with, with, bar, with a total bar lengths. So I already used, used this uh, bound of total bar length here in terms of the maximal length and the number of the bars. Right, so, so I had, I had uh, this inequality, but I kind of, I, I bounded this part in terms of k times beta, and I bounded uh, the left-hand side in, from the left uh, in terms of p times beta. Okay, so, so I get this bound, but, but we know that on semi-simple manifolds, on semi-simple manifolds, th this guy is uniformly bounded, so by 8n, let's say. <clears throat> so, 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 so I get 8n times, well, number of bars phi p of p, but number of bars phi p of p is the same as number of bars phi q. So, so what we end up is on the left, we have something that, that grows uh, strictly linearly with, with p. And on the right hand side, we have something that's bounded. This, is kind of, this goes to infinity and this is bounded. So, so, so that's a contradiction and, and the, the, the end of the proof. Is that all right? Um, I, I hear Dusa. Do, 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 do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering why why um, this quantity here is bounded, the beta FP FP. You're saying it's completely bounded by A10. Yes, yes, yes. Why is so, that? so, okay. So, 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 uh, um, in, <laughs> so. So first of all, you can prove, uh, so, so let's restrict to CPN first. So first of all, you, you can prove, uh, so this is the result of, of, of Kislev and, and me. So we proved that beta is general, generally speaking less than gamma. So gamma is the spectral norm, okay? And, and, and for CPN by, by result of Antov Polterovich, we know that gamma is unif uh, uniformly bounded. And uh, in general, for semi-simple case, this is harder. Uh, and basically what one does is one splits the barcode into pieces corresponding each one to, its, uh, to, to the unit in the corresponding field. And then to each one of these parts, you can apply, um, apply the end of Polterovich argument. And uh, one cannot do the same for 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 a spectral norm, but uh, uh, but at, at least for lengths of bars, it's okay. Okay. All right. So um, let me just uh, say something very very brief about. Uh, uh, further development um, that, that is very very recent, and um, and maybe not give too much detail. So <laughs> I I must say that uh, so the, the the title here is, uh, is is due to the title of, of a beautiful talk I heard of Schmuel Van Weinberger and. Uh, I was waiting for an opportunity to, to use this in, in the talk, and so I think this is one. <clears throat> so, uh, so, so this story is about uh, finite group actions. <clears throat> and it is joint work with a student, with my student, Marcelo Atal. <clears throat> so, so f f uh, first of all, uh, uh, a beautiful result of, of, of DUSA from 2009 says that uh, a closed uh, symplectic manifold with a, let's say, non-trivial Hamiltonian S1 action must be uniruled. So in, in terms of gram witten invariance. And this of course implies that it's geometrically uniruled so, 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 to say that for any J-holomorphic uh, 
uh, for any uh, omega compatible almost complex structure J and any X in the manifold, there's a J holomorphic sphere passing through it and it's a non-constant. Non um, and second, second fact is the notorian result of Polterovich that I mentioned earlier. And also there have been uh, uh, some proofs for, for manifolds. Um, and maybe if one more fact is that on rational rule symplectic for manifolds, uh, all Hamiltonian cyclic actions come from S1 actions. So then uh, there is a question uh, in uh, uh, Dusso and Dietmar's uh, uh, book, which I, which I paraphrase, I, I, I hope it's uh, uh, sufficiently close to, to, to the original. And uh, what I want to say, is, so the question is kind of, is Hamiltonian torsion, Hamiltonian finite order diffeomorphisms uh, related to holomorphic curves? And um, so, so in, in joint, ah, ah oh, yes, and uh, and by the way, some sort of uh, aside is that, you know, Smith theory was the finite group action. So perhaps Smith theory and Fleur homology can help answer uh, qu questions of, of this kind. So, uh, so in joint work with Marcelo Atala, we have addressed this question and uh, we, we have uh, three, uh, th three results. So first result, has to do with uh, topological conditions. So we can b basically prove um, uh, Polterovich's no torsion theorem uh, for not only symplectically spherical manifolds, but also negatively monotone manifolds and symplectically Calabi-Yau manifolds. So this is succinctly f formalized in, in this uh, situation. And of course, uh, let's say Calabi-Yau manifolds are not really uniruled. So, 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 so this, this is actually um, this fits with with uh, and Dietmar's question. And then uh, second part is that uh, let's say that M omega is positively monotone. Then we prove that if uh, there is torsion, then uh, the manifold has to be geometrically unirolled. We don't know if it's going to be unirolled in the sense of gram witten invariance, but geometrically unirolled it will be. <clears throat> and uh, finally, we can also prove that torsion in a Hamiltonian group of monotone symplectic manifold is never Hofer small. In fact, it's never small in the spectral norm. And where, where, where here's somehow uh, you have a torsion diffeomorphism and you look at all its powers. So at least one of these powers is going to be good. So in the C0 setting, this was proven uh, in 1931 by, by Newman. And um, so, so, so uh, rho, rho here is um, you know, the, 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 the positive generator of the, the, the period group of omega. And I have, uh, well, do I have one more minute? Yes, or... that's fine. Okay, great. So, so I will say ju just a, a tiny bit about, um, about, uh, about uh, the, the idea. So the idea is uh, to use, you know, uh, asymptotics uh, of what happens for large iterations to study uh, periodic diffeomorphisms so of, of finite order. Right, so in the in this in this sense, we're using telescope as microscope. <laughs> and um, well, perhaps um, technically, so we restrict to Q torsion where Q is prime. Let's find that group groups contain uh, uh, you know um, elements of prime order, and then we generalize the action index methods actually all the possible methods related to the uh, conjecture to a compact isolated pass connected sets of periodic points. So, so kind of think Morse bot. All right, and so the, the first case is uh, really, really close uh, along the lines of uh, the paper of Solomon Sander. You basically show that with iterations indices either grow to infinity so this kind of this corresponds to positive index, 
or are strictly less than n. So this is corresponds to non-negative meanings. And the strict inequality is, is this kind of weak non-degeneracy, which holds for, for, for torsion diffeomorphisms. <clears throat> and then, uh, so negative monotone case is similar, and with Polterovich no torsion, these are actually the three classes of manifolds to consider. And um, maybe, maybe uh, uh, final thing about the proof of part two, which is maybe a partial, partial solution to question of uh, Dusa and Dietmar. So the, the first step is to prove that the total, uh, the, the, the total um, bar length is zero. And this is again a telescope microscope argument. So the total beta is bounded because it can only take a finite number of values. But at the, at the same time, uh, we, we generalize the, the Smith type inequality and prove that it must grow linearly unless beta dot is zero. So it must be zero. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, arguments uh, that, that, uh, that I, ha I had before for p equal to two and uh, that are being generalized by Seidel, Wink, Wilkins, and myself uh, for uh, p greater are somehow sufficiently robust to, to apply. But um, um, and uh, I must also say that uh, part three is perhaps a story for another time, but it uh, definitely uses this uh, part A here. So um, I, 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 I have a, some extra material regarding pseudo rotations, but, but perhaps it's uh, time to, to stop. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions for Yegor. I already see one from Marco Castronovo, so please unmute yourself and go ahead, Marco. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, so maybe if you can go back to uh, one of the first theorems you stated uh, about monotone symplectic manifolds with semi-simple semi quantum cohomology. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Uh, so oh, you, so. The statement was if you have a, a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism uh, with enough uh, fixed points, then uh, there must be infinitely many periodic points. And you say that something stronger is true, uh, that for every uh, ah, ah, you, you, you mean you said um, you say that something uh, stronger is true that for every prime yes uh, part B of the remark yes yes yes, yes for yes. every prime uh, well actually for every okay I missed this part uh, for every large prime uh, you have p periodic uh, points yes yes uh, so I was wondering if the quantum cohomology is not semi simple can you have some Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms with infinitely many periodic points, but, but still no p periodic points for some uh, that primes p. Ah, uh, no, I, I, I think the, the current proofs of Conley conjecture actually prove exactly uh, that, that, that for uh, same thing that for all large primes, um, you have you you do have uh, new periodic points. So in in particular, the, the argument of uh, Solomon Sender in the weakly non-degenerate case uh, works uh, to to prove exactly exactly the statement. Um, and but that doesn't require semi-simplicity of quantum cohomology. No, absolutely yeah. not. No, that's not no. Okay, okay, okay. No, 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 absolutely not. All right, thank you. So um, this is neat. I wanted to ask about maybe three quarters of the way through, you gave um, a, a sketch of the proof of your main result, I think, for k equal to q. Um, and I was wondering if that proof changes substantially when k is not q. Mm, not that much. Not that much. So, OK. So. Um, 
um, it gives a, a weaker result. So, but, but uh, so, okay, so, so, so the, the diff, okay, I can say what the difference is. I, I will not write it out, but I will say what the difference is. So, first of all, the different, one difference is that you don't need anymore this kind of Lefschetz principle, or, you know, um, uh, universal coefficient formula, because you just fix a prime, right? And, and then instead of looking at phi to the p for, a, for various primes, you, 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 you're going to, you, you, um, you, know, uh, you, you you can you, you fix prime fix p and then look at at phi to the p to the j exactly exactly like in in this case of uh, finite order things okay and then you still have uh, have that it's you know beta of phi to the p to the j grows linearly in p to the j Okay, and uh, th this uniform bound—it's—it's it's still it's the same uniform bound. So 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 basically you're in good shape. Um, uh, so th the reason it doesn't give a stronger bound is exactly in this point that I somehow glossed over here. Which was from 2010. So it might be uh, that after you created a new point. You, you have to iterate it quite a lot until uh, until this starts holding. So 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 so, so this way it's it's hard to kind of estimate the growth of the number of uh, you know uh, periodic points. But you know you can in this case for such iterations you can prove that of course this is a monotone increasing function and you can prove that it's unbounded, but. I cannot say much more about it. Thanks. OK, uh, any more questions for Yegor? All right. Um, if not, let's, let's all give him. OK, um, so that ends the uh, official Q&A period. Um, if anyone has questions they want to ask Yegor um, in a more casual context, they're invited to uh, stay on the call and ask him, if that's okay with you, Yegor. Um, and uh, so we'll see everyone when we reconvene in September. Um, as I said before, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Simeon Reschikov has a comment. This is for the informal period though. Oh, okay, okay, great. Uh, then I was just gonna say that um, we'll reconvene in September and we will have at least one uh, a special event in August and stay tuned for that. Okay.